Bitcoin is internet money, but it's a lot more than that. And I think for this audience in particular, for people who are here to make a fair, I think I want to talk about Bitcoin from the perspective of the misfits, the weirdos, the freaks, the people who refuse to think the way everybody else thinks, the people who see a half-working, elegant technology and don't look at the half-working, they look at the elegant side. And they recognize innovation. And they recognize innovation not just a few months or a few years before others, but sometimes a decade before others recognize innovation. And that's the kind of people who go to make a fair. And I think that's going to be a great place to start talking about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is unexpected. Bitcoin is not money as we know it. Bitcoin should not have happened. Bitcoin really has no possibility of success. It can't possibly work. It's one of those things that does not work in theory, but it works in practice. Like Wikipedia, like Linux, like the internet. Weird ideas made by people with ponytails and neck beards. Weirdos who nobody really trusts. And Bitcoin succeeds because it works, because as a technology, it's an element. So I want to talk about that spirit of the misfit, walking into an industry and saying, you know what, we're about to change everything, and being laughed out of the room, and then keeping on and going on until, in fact, they change everything. And this happens in technology all the time. We just forget about it. We ignore it. We rewrite the history. It all looks glowing. This video we just watched about the early automobile. Do you know what the media said about the early automobile? They ridiculed cars. They mocked cars. Cars were slower than horses. Cars broke down all the time. Cars needed expensive gasoline that you couldn't find anywhere, and they required enormous amounts of infrastructure to work. And so the media focused on the part of the story that sold the most papers: car accidents, pedestrians mangled by cars. And for more than two decades from the first cars, the story was that of infernal, disgusting, dirty, noisy machines that were far inferior to horses, that couldn't go anywhere, that only weirdos would use, and that most of the time killed the occupants and everyone who came anywhere near them. This hysteria got so bad that in 1896, in the UK, they passed a law called the Red Flag Act. And the Red Flag Act was a law that required that any operator of a vehicle had three crew members on staff, a driver, an engineer, and a flagman. The driver would operate the vehicle, the engineer would supervise that operation, think railroads, right? And the flagman would carry a red flag and run a hundred yards ahead of the car to warn pedestrians of the imminent arrival of an infernal death machine that was going to mow them down. Guess what happened to the UK? They lost the automobile industry race. Because they saw that technology and instead of seeing potential, they allowed fear to define their reaction. And so they created an environment where a car could not do the things that a car can do. Because if you make a car go as slow as the pedestrian who's running ahead of it with a red flag, you lose all of the advantage of a car. If a car requires a three-person crew to operate, you lose the advantages of a car. So they tried to take the car and understand it from the perspective of railroads and horses, and they failed. And they lost the race. And what you didn't see on this video was that actually until that time, they were winning. The 
first really practical cars were built in England. Because they'd already won the race for the Industrial Revolution with a steam engine. At that time, England was a powerhouse of industrial innovation. And they were winning until they decided that this dirty machine should be confined to a very limited space and a set of rules. And they killed the goose. No more golden eggs for that. So, that is instructive, because this happens again and again in technology. When electricity was first domesticated, and people started electrifying their homes, do you think the media went out and said, this is brilliant. Edison's a genius. This is going to change the world. No. What they said was that this was dangerous technology that would burn down people's homes. And they ran story after story after story about people getting electrocuted, about homes burning down. And of course, you couldn't really use electricity because it required a complete overhaul of your house, and you had to put wires in your house. You know, the wires that would burn it down. And you would have to buy special devices to connect to these wires just before your house burned down. And only the rich could afford it. So clearly this was a technology that was really just an affectation of the rich. It was just a plaything with no practical value. The mayor of Paris during the Paris Fair in 1896, I believe, said, after the fair is over, this fad of electricity will be forgotten as quickly as the lights turn off. Famous last words are very common in technology. Words that in retrospect look ridiculous. Like the head of IBM who once said, I foresee a need for no more than five computers worldwide. <coughs> like the people who said that the telephone will never succeed. Well, guess what people are saying about Bitcoin? They are telling you that it is a technology that is weird and complicated, a technology that caters to misfits, drug dealers, degenerates, pornographers, terrorists, thieves, swindlers. I don't see any of those people in this room, but we better be careful just in case they show up. Of course, they are wrong. Bitcoin is none of those things. Bitcoin is simply a technology. And as a technology, it is often the first use it finds is often in the hands of criminals. The first cars were used as getaway vehicles. The first telephones were used to plot conspiracy. The first telegrams were used to run long-distance mail fraud schemes and Ponzi schemes. And the first forms of electricity were used to run medical hoaxes and scam people. These things always happen with any new technology. And so they happen with Bitcoin too. Why do you think criminals use technology like that? Well, we could be moralistic about it, we could look at the actual reasons. Criminals use the most cutting-edge technology because they operate in an environment of very high profit margins and very high risk. And in that environment, competition is fierce. And using the latest technology, if you're already taking enormous risks, isn't that big a deal. But if you win, it gives you an enormous advantage. And so throughout history, the most amazing technology is adopted by criminals first. Now, I don't think that's necessarily what we want to put on the Bitcoin marketing plan. But it's interesting to look at what criminals do and how that ends up being mainstream technology a decade later. There's a certain dynamic there. Bitcoin is already way past its early stage and is no longer the purview of criminals. In fact, arguably it really wasn't in the first place. 
even despite what the media said. Now Bitcoin is hitting the mainstream, and things are changing very rapidly. So I want to talk about Bitcoin as a technology, because something very exciting is happening. Something that is going to shake up the financial and banking system as much as cars shook up the horse industry, as much as oil shook up the whaling industry, as much as electricity shook up the wood stove industry. Banking is about to be disrupted. Arguably, it is already being disrupted. In fact, by the time they figure out how serious this disruption is, the game is already over. That is usually the case. When you look at established trends in industries, they see a new disruptive technology. and At first, they ignore it, because it can't possibly pose a threat. Because from the benefit of incumbency, from the high perch of an established monopolistic business, these threats look like children playing around. To J.P. Morgan Chase, Bitcoin is like a lemonade stand trying to take on Walmart. But if they continue to do that, then they go into the next phase where they start mocking the technology, where they suddenly see it everywhere and they start making jokes about it. So, just like with the automobile, the first people who bought cars were mocked, were mocked because they were shown always on their knees with a spanner trying to fix their machine that had broken down again. That was the image of an automobile owner in the first years. And so while they mock it, Bitcoin continues to grow and continues to improve. And after a while, you see a change. At first, some of the incumbents in the industry say, hey, maybe we need to experiment with this. Maybe we need to start looking at this. And then there's a stampede, because suddenly they realize this is going to change our industry forever. By that time, it's too late. By that time, your Kodak, going from number one in the world to within three years losing a $12 billion industry right out the, under their feet, to a company they would never heard of before, a company that didn't even make cameras. Do you know who destroyed Kodak? A little Finnish company they never heard of called Nokia. A company that didn't make cameras until they did. And within three years, they made half a billion cameras and destroyed Kodak. Tower Records dominated the music industry. And then within four years, they disappeared. Why? because MP3 gave people choice. IBM used to be the most unshakable company in computers. They guaranteed quality. In fact, buying anything but IBM was a sure sign that you were a loser. And then Linux happened. And Linux shook IBM to its core because it subverted the very basic idea that in order to deliver quality of engineering and in order to deliver the best computers possible for the serious work of banking and engineering and government operations, you needed IBM. You needed a closed, controlled, carefully organized system built by serious PhD engineers. Now, if you looked back in 1992, when Linus Torvald said, "I'm going to build an operating system in my dorm room because I can't afford to buy an operating system," that idea seemed completely preposterous. Operating systems were enormous edifices of complexity that it took thousands of engineers to build. And Linus Torvald started simple and started building an operating system. Six years later, Linux had started dominating the computing industry, and Sun Microsystems was beginning to feel the pain. Eight years later, Sun Microsystems were heading to bankruptcy. 
HP was getting bought. Their computer division was shutting down, and IBM stepped out of the personal computing business. And now, 80% of the cell phones on the planet run Android, which, by the way, is Linux. And the servers they connect to run Linux. And the banks we use run Linux. And the entertainment systems we use run Linux. And the cars we drive run Linux. You can always tell if it's not running Linux. A little blue screen that greets you and says, "Sorry, crashed. Wrong choice of operating system." You get into a plane. The entertainment system boots up. It's running Linux. If you said to an IBM engineer 15 years ago, "You are about to be destroyed by an operating system built by a Finnish student in their dorm," they would have laughed at you. And so here we are today. And Bitcoin is taking on the entire banking system, the most powerful industry in the world. And guess what? Bitcoin is going to win. And it's going to win for a very simple reason. It's not just going to win because it's better. It's not just going to win because the banking system is run by gangsters and crooks and some of the most immoral, empty suits in the world. It's not just going to win because the banking system has spent the last 50 years delivering two consumer innovations, ATMs and credit cards, and then spent the rest of the time trying to figure out how to fleece you. It's going to win because it's open. And in a world of tinkerers, and in a world of experimenters, and in a world of makers, open Wins. And the reason it wins is because it allows innovation to flourish at the edges. Let me explain what I mean by that. Every single financial system in the world has a security and trust model that requires excluding bad actors. I can't connect to the Visa network and program it, because doing so would endanger the security of the Visa network. I can't connect to the SWIFT network, the worldwide interbank fund transfer, the wire transfer network, because doing so would endanger the security of that network. All of these networks are designed to be closed because their primary security relies on access control, on very carefully vetting every single person who has access and touches the code, and on very carefully vetting all of the applications that run on that system. Because if they allow one bad actor into the heart of the system, that security is gone. That one bad actor can take over and do whatever they want. Of course, in 2008, we discovered that the bad actors owned the banks. And they did take over. And they destroyed millions of homeowners and millions of retirees and millions of savers all around the world with their greed. But Bitcoin is different. And the reason it's different is not because we've suddenly found the most honest people in the world, or because there are no crooks in Bitcoin, or because the network doesn't get attacked. Bitcoin is different because there are plenty of crooks in Bitcoin. And the network gets attacked all the time, but it doesn't depend on access control to remain secure. It depends on a simple mathematical formula of incentives and rewards. In order to participate in the Bitcoin network and secure the network as a miner, which is a special function in Bitcoin, you have to use a lot of computing power and spend a lot of electricity. If you win that competition, you get Bitcoin as a reward. And that simple equation creates a system of incentives where it's far better to play with the rules than against the rules. It's game theory. It's like a giant game of Sudoku. Now, if you look at that as a computer scientist or even more as a banker, you say, well, that can't possibly work. What do you mean it's a giant game of Sudoku and everybody's competing against each other? That's not the basis of a security system. That would bring chaos. It's kind of like saying, 
What do you mean it's an encyclopedia that anyone can edit? That would bring chaos, said Encyclopedia Britannica. If you're under 40, you've never heard of it. <laughs> Bitcoin is a completely open network. Anyone can connect to it. You can write an application right now and connect to the Bitcoin network and teach it to do something in you. You can write a new financial service, you can write a new financial instrument. And when you do so, you don't have to identify yourself to the network. You don't have to get permission from anyone, you don't have to be vetted, you don't have to be secured, and the network doesn't fear you because its security doesn't depend on keeping bad actors out. In fact, Bitcoin works fine with plenty of bad actors right to the core of the system. There is no core in the system. There is no center. It's a completely decentralized system. And so what happens when you create a network where open access to financial services is possible for the first time in history, where anyone can connect and write an application? Bitcoin isn't a currency. And that's a really important thing to realize. Currency is an app that runs on the Bitcoin network. Bitcoin is the internet of money, and currency is just the first app. And today, there are a thousand companies writing the next app. And those companies are hiring tens of thousands of people in one of the most vibrant industries we have seen in the last two decades. In 2014, Bitcoin is receiving more than $250 million of investment and the startup companies within it. And what's remarkable about that is that that is faster than the rate of investments on the internet in 1995. We are ahead of the curve. Bitcoin is growing faster than Twitter did in the first three years. Bitcoin is growing faster than Facebook grew in the first few years. And the reason for that is because every misfit, weirdo, freak programmer from anywhere in the world can now connect to Bitcoin without asking anyone's permission and take their weirdo, misfit idea and build a new financial service, a new banking application, a new shopping application, a new escrow application. And that's exactly what people are doing. They're building things that are innovative and new and brilliant, things we've never seen in banking before. Things that wouldn't get past the first planning meeting in your average bank, because they'd get shot down. And so when you have these two environments running side by side, a banking environment where everything requires permission, and permission is most certainly not granted, and a system which is completely open, where Innovation can happen at the edge without permission. Guess who wins? Guess where all of the exciting things happen? Guess where all of the innovation happens? And this is innovation that serves consumers. No one is sitting on Bitcoin and trying to find a way how to front run a high frequency trading algorithm so they can squeeze three micro cents about four microseconds faster than the other giant bank that's playing with all those. No one is trying to find a way to screw you out of your overdraft facility. An innovation that was pioneered by one of the big banks in I think it was 2007, where they realized that if you were close to your overdraft limit, if instead of running the big transaction first, they flipped the order of the transactions and ran a lot of the small ones, you'd pay a $25 fee for every one of them and they can maximize their fees. That's the kind of innovation they were focused on. So they innovated. They innovated more and more ways to screw their customers. And on Bitcoin, nobody's doing that kind of innovation. And the reason they're not doing that kind of innovation is because Bitcoin, you can't force someone to take your app. If you bank with a big bank, it's their network. It's their policy. You're using their debit card and playing by their rules. And if you don't like it, you can go elsewhere and discover that they're all the same. On Bitcoin, it's an opt-in system. You choose to use it. You choose what apps you're going to run. 
You choose who you're going to interact with, and you choose the rules of the game by which you're going to interact. And if you don't like an app, you don't download it. And if you love an app, you download it and you tell all your friends about it. And that's why Bitcoin is going to win. Because it delivers innovation that consumers want and consumers need. And there's another reason. Because there's a massive imbalance that most people here don't notice. Every person in this room has access to a bank account without currency controls. A bank account from which they can buy and sell any currency in the world. A bank account from which they can wire money anywhere in the world. A bank account from which they can access international markets like the Tokyo Stock Exchange or the German Stock Exchange, a market from which they can access credit and liquidity, auto loans and mortgages. A bank account which is powerful, and that power is available to about a billion people on this planet. A billion people who have access to full-fledged, international, high-liquidity banking facilities. There are two billion people who have no bank accounts at all. And there is another four billion people who have very, very limited access to banking. Banking without international currencies, banking without international markets, banking without liquidity. So Bitcoin isn't about the one billion. Bitcoin is all about the other six and a half billion. The people who currently are cut off from international banking. What do you think happens when you suddenly are able to turn a simple text messaging phone in the middle of a rural area in Nigeria, connected to a solar panel, into a bank terminal, into a Western Union remittances terminal, into an international loan origination system, into a stock market, into an IPO engine? At first, nothing. But give it a few years. We've seen what happens with the development of cell phone technology, which was deployed in Africa faster than any other technology ever in the history of humanity. You see small villages where they have no running water, where they have wood fires to cook with, there's no electricity. There's one little solar panel on the top of a mud hut, and that solar panel is not there for a light. It's there to charge a Nokia 1000 feature phone, because that phone gives them weather reports, and it gives them grain prices in the local market, and it connects them to the world. Now, what happens when that phone becomes a bank? Because with Bitcoin, it can be a bank. And what happens when you connect six and a half billion people to a global economy without any barriers of access? Bitcoin is not a currency. Bitcoin is the internet of money. And as a technology, it can bring economic inclusion and empowerment to billions of people in the world. I'll give you one example of a specific application that is going to fundamentally change the lives of more than a billion people over the next five to ten years. Every day, an immigrant somewhere cashes their paycheck and stands in line to wire 50 percent of that paycheck back to their home country to feed an extended family. Right? Here in the U.S., 60 million people have no bank accounts, and yet they cash their paychecks and send them abroad. Overall, in the world, $515 billion are transmitted every year in the form of remittances, foreign remittances, from first world countries to five major destinations. Mexico, India, the Philippines, Indonesia, and China. And these five destinations, in some of these places, remittances form 20, 30, or 40 percent of the local economy. And sitting on top of that flow of 500 billion dollars are companies like Western Union. And they take a 15 percent cut 
of every single one of these transactions, out of the pockets of the poorest people in the world. Now, imagine what happens when one day one of these immigrants figures out that they can do the same thing with Bitcoin, not for 15%, not for 10%, not for 5%, but for 5 cents. Not a percentage, a flat fee. What happens when they can do that? Because they can, right now. We've seen a company start up that is handling remittances between the U.S. and the Philippines. They're doing a few million dollars right now, but they're going to start growing. And there's 500 billion dollars sitting behind that dam. And when you're an immigrant and you can change your financial future by not paying 15 percent to send money home. Imagine what happens if every month, instead of sending 80 bucks home, you send 100 bucks home. That makes a difference. There's a billion people right now who have access to the internet and feature phones who could use Bitcoin as an international wire transfer service. So, to sum up, Bitcoin is the most exciting technology I have seen. I was around in 1989 on the internet as a young kid, and I saw that, and I knew it was going to change the world long before most people figured it out. And I told everyone around me, "We're going to be shopping on this. We're going to do banking on this thing." And people's reaction was quite predictable. Yeah, Andreas, go do your homework. Clean up your room. And when I first saw Linux, I thought, man, this is going to change operating systems forever. IBM is going down. And everybody laughed at me. And when I saw the first web browser and the first website, and I thought, every single company in America is going to have a website within a decade. And everybody laughed at me. Well, let me tell you something. I don't know what's going to happen with Bitcoin, but I do know that the underlying invention, a system of digital currencies that has no banks, no governments, no central control, and is available for anyone to use without asking permission, it will change the world. 